Yeah, thank you. Um, so I've been a small talker now for about 25 years, and essentially two decades ago, we kind of started working on the refactory browser. So the title of the talk is, you know, two decades of the refactory browser. It could also be named Refactoring by Dummies. Uh, there's a picture of Don and I from about, oh, probably 17 years ago in front of the refactoring browser then. So I looked, and exactly 20 years ago yesterday, the first version of refactory browser came out. This is the catalog card um, for the FTP site at the time. And if you look, it says it's a, basically a better browser plus a lint tool. Besides the name, refactoring, you know, we, didn't, we weren't pushing refactoring. But the refactoring browser isn't the first tool that we actually built. We built a, a tool called the refactory tool, and that came out uh, essentially about a year and a half earlier. Um, the problem with the refactory tool is, and here's a picture of it, is that it wasn't actually integrated into any browser. Essentially, if you wanted to do refactoring, you would open up this tool, select which refactoring you want to do, input all the various data, and then hit the little do it button down at the bottom right. One interesting thing with this is that, uh, I don't know, if, probably nobody can see it, but this one here says convert superclass to component. That refactoring um, wasn't really refactoring, and so it's, it got removed by the time refactoring browser came out because it would break your, severely break your code. Of course, the problem with that tool is that, much like the PHP hammer, it didn't fit anybody's style of actually programming. Um, you know, the PHP hammer with the two claws doesn't really hammer in a nail. Uh, the refactory browser with, you know, a separate window, nobody actually used. And I bet neither Don or I ever actually used it in real life, besides just example demos. So we, we had to come up with a new way to get refactoring in. You know, you're two graduate students. You, you're trying to sell refactoring. Nobody's using your stuff. You have to come up with a new way of doing it. So at the time, uh, Ralph Johnson, our advisor, basically said what you need to do is to build a better browser. You know, the, the, the standard system browser in VisualWorks at the time had several issues. Everybody knew what they, you know, were. Just improve on that browser, and once you introduce them to the browser, you can say, oh, by the way, there's these other refactorings. And, of course, that's essentially the Trojan horse effect. Um, so, so that's what we did. And, of course, the side effect of that is many other development environments now have things called refactoring browsers when they're really not the browser like a Smalltalk browser. So one of the things we had to do was to essentially throw away the, for us, throw away the VisualWorks browser and use our browser extensively. So we, in one sense of the word, we ate our own dog food. And at least from our standpoint, it's a lot easier than this guy who ate his own dog food of inventing a table saw, which once it detects that it touches flesh, um, stops the table saw immediately. At least we didn't have to st stick our finger into the table saw actually do this. All we had to do was use a browser. But that, but by using the browser, it essentially led us to our own uh, criteria of design of what a good browser should, should be. So we came up with um, our, our design of what is good enough for a refactoring environment. And the first point is that the refactoring must be fairly fast. If the developer perceives that they can um, do the refactoring by themselves quicker, they will not use your tool. So, you know, we and and we we also thought that most developers overestimate how fast they can do stuff. So it has to be essentially about twice as fast as maybe what a developer would do by hand, or else we consider it too slow and we would not implement it as a refactoring. The second thing is it has to be fairly accurate. 
if the developer sees that simple little things aren't being done, they're not going to use your tool because they'll say, you know, why, why should I introduce some bugs in my software someplace and when I can do it myself? And most people, most developers overestimate their accuracy. So they'll overestimate their own accuracy, underestimate your tool's accuracy, but, you know, that's another bad point for your tool. And when you combine those two points together, we came up with a third idea of what we need to do was if we don't know something, instead of trying to, you know, do some expensive analysis, which might take, you know, several minutes and which then the developer's not going to use your tool, or just guess whether it's true or not, we can just ask the user, hey, do you, do you really want to do this? Is this okay? And that, that way there, we can put it back into the developer's hands of whether this refactoring should be done or not. So that's kind of our criteria for the, the good enough. As opposed to this car. <laughs> Um, we, didn't, we did not want our, our program to crash and burn like the Ford Pinto. So, and, and part of that, you know, if your program's too slow, they won't use it. So, if your program's buggy, they won't use it. And, of course, how do you do that? And the biggest thing for us was testing. Back 20 years ago, the S unit, I don't even know if it existed yet. Um, I think Kent you know, had talked about testing, but I don't think he had created the program yet. So essentially our testing involved just going through the base image. You have, you know, a thousand classes or whatever is in the base image, uh, probably 20,000 methods or 30,000 methods. Essentially that, that gives you all the code you need to test. And so it's easy to invent test cases. One of, one of the things that's really nice, too, is that by testing on certain classes in the base image, like ordered collection or strings or object, essentially what you're doing is verifying that your, your, your code that you transformed is actually working because if you actually mess up something in ordered collection, the chances are the image, small talk image is going to crash fairly, fairly soon. And in fact, um, that's how we found one bug in like abstracting um, class variables. If you um, just do it as on the instance side as self class the variable name, that works fine for everything except for object. An object in Smalltalk is a special case where it's both the, the super class of the instance side and the super class of the meta class side. And so the self-class variable name does not work in those cases. And that's how we found that, by just essentially testing everything in the Smalltalk image. Um, so normally when we give demos, of this, um, essentially we would go and play around with things like object or we, we could even rename plus, for example. So that, that was always to, good to give confidence to, to users. So one, one of the things that did bite us when we did give one demo was we, we tried to re, um, rename remove first on ordered collection. The problem there is that you have uh, blocks that live and are running outside of the compiled code, and the process scheduler itself is one of those blocks, and it sends remove first. And so if you remove or rename remove first, you immediately crash, and then you sit around and wonder why, why that was while you're giving the demo. But... But the main point of testing is that you don't want to, your users to break up with you. Essentially, you know, here, here you have the little kid, you know, it's not you, it's, it's me, except that it's you. So you don't want your users to basically say, you know, we're going to quit using the browser because your refactorings broke my code. And I think for the most part, this was not an issue for us. Now, we did have several people say, you know, code formatting was an issue, and that's all right because that wasn't our focus. The code formatting was not the focus of the browser. We wanted to, you know, ensure that the refactorings was the focus. So if you used a refactoring and it gave a, a buggy result, we didn't, you know, we, we thought that was something we were really important to us. 
um, I think in probably the five years or so we was kind of developing it main, um, actively. There's probably one bug that was reported by the users on refactoring, and I knew about that bug. It, um, it just, I, I, it's one of those cases where I did not prompt the user that it might create a bug, but maybe I should have. But there was also some bugs that, quote, bugs that were reported where essentially refactorings did not allow um, certain things. Certain things that they thought were refactorings that were not allowed by the tool because they weren't, in fact, refactorings. Now, it's important in any, any of these cases, and I don't know, probably several of you do not know who this person is. I know some of you do, but um, this is Kent Beck. Um, he used to be a pretty big small talker back in the 1980s and 90s. Uh, now I think the Wall Street Journal knows him as Kent Beck, Facebook programmer. <laughs> um, so, and he is also the inventor of the XP style of programming. And back when we were doing this refactoring work, he was also promoting the XP programming. And he would he would go out and give talks to various companies. Uh, every place, and he had talked about the refactoring tool. So he was probably the biggest reason why a lot of people use refactoring tools today, is from Kent Beck telling people that they need to do refactoring tools. And back then, we had you know people asking for refactoring environments for Java or whatever who had never seen Smalltalk. They just knew that they wanted refactoring in their tools due to Kent Beck. Kent is also responsible, you know, he's also, in addition to being the salesperson, he is also our best customer. So it's important to have good customers. Um, he suggested various refactorings that were implemented. You know, it's not that we didn't know about how to, you know, know these refactorings need to be implemented. It's just that he gave priority. So, like, inline method. Normally, inlining a method is considered, you know, oh, you're making an existing method longer, um, so you probably shouldn't prioritize refactoring for inline method. So we always knew that inline method was a refactoring, but then we not, did not prioritize it as something we wanted to do. However, since Kent suggested it, we kind of moved it up the chain, and we implemented it. And after we implemented it, we notice that inline method is used a lot more than what we want, especially whenever you're moving boundaries around. And without his insight there, you know, this is something we would never have done. I think undo is another thing that came out of Kent's suggestions. You know, it came, you know, it's one of those things that's obvious, oh, undo refactoring should be there. But by having a good customer that you trust with what they're priorities are, you can you know, move your, your priorities, implementation priorities around. So part of the implementation what we, we worked on was kind of transforming the verb-like things like refactoring, rename something, into first-class objects. Now the standard OO, you know, is the You've probably heard that, oh, your nouns are objects and your ver verbs are methods on those objects. Um, however, for this here, we, we, we made refactorings be first class, meaning that they're actually objects. And this allowed us to do things like, oh, you can compose the refactorings easier. We've also made other things like first class, like changes. You know, before you might have just a method that compiled the method. Well, by introducing a change object to compile the method, that makes stuff like undo easier. So, by one of the underlying points of this is that, you know, having the first class objects there really made some things easier to implement. So, the biggest thing with refactorings is that um, how do you actually perform the change on the code itself? Initially, 
we had methods that looked like this. Here's the, the method that actually changed the code for renaming. And maybe somebody in the front who is really quick could see that this actually has a, has a few bugs in it, essentially, but um, since it was just doing string-based manipulation, it had, you know, it, you could make up an example which has, shows a bug. So when I, when I first came to the refactoring part, I saw this method and I, I saw the bugs in it. So I, of course, there. <laughs> and you throw up, but. So, so you, you come up with a different way of doing things. And I had, I had uh, looked at Prolog before and some things like that in which it's a pattern-based approach of um, programming. So the first implementation was back then in VisualWorks that um, underscores were treated specially because um, probably some of you that might work with Squeak or Faro or whatever um, knew that the little arrow key for assignments, well, you, that was kind of the underscore key underscore in the source code itself. So underscore was treated differently. Um, the compiler did not accept underscores as part of the variable name. However, VisualWorks had a little flag you could set that said, oh, you could, you could use underscores as your variables. So I used that to hack an extension onto the, the, uh, the, the standard VisualWorks parser that allowed underscores to be pattern variables. So in this one here, basically underscore, the first underscore meant it was a pattern variable, the second underscore meant something else. And I think there's a total of five different positions there that you could put underscores in to mean something special. And of course, Don looked at it and goes, <laughs> what, what, what's the problem? You know, because essentially I had to write this big long uh, comment that said what each underscore position was and everything. So, um, so came then like about a year later, um, we decided to port the refactorings over to Visual Edge Smalltalk. And so that required a new parser. And in the new parser, we came up with this new syntax, which said that anything beginning with a backquote character was a pattern. Then you could have other modifiers in addition to that. But that was essentially the, the difference. And, you know, essentially the underscore in the second position became the second backquote or whatever. And the backquote character came from looking at the keyboard and saying what character does not Smalltalk use already, and that's pretty much the only character on the keyboard that Smalltalk didn't use. And of course, that made people happy, some people. One of, one of the things after having that is that that allowed us to build the rewrite tool. Essentially, it's, we noticed that in doing the port to Visual Age, oh, being able to quickly replace a lot of different code is a very handy thing to have. And so we built the rewrite tool, just added it onto the browser as an extension and said, oh, you can use it if you want. It's there. And so that's... And we just basically let them use it if they wanted to. It's not a real um, main point of refactoring browser, but it can be handy at times. And I believe the, the picture there with the little baby there with the razor blade, um, Kent Beck had made a comment at one time saying that the rewrite tool was like giving razor blades to babies. So that's why here's why I have the picture. Now, the problem with you know, the, the previous syntax is that, you know, it's still complex to understand. A lot of people still do not understand it. I think there's uh, something on the payroll list or something where somebody was having issues with it earlier this week. So, and I, I, know, I know, know those issues, yeah. I've worked with it for quite some time, but, it's not, you know, it's good for a lot of things. It's not so good for some, but it, it is a very powerful tool. And essentially, once you're into rewriting code, you just basically say screw behavior preservation because you're no longer refactoring, even though a particular rewrite may be refactoring. Most of the time, it's 
whatever you need to do. So with that, we came up with um, essentially, we decided to we kind of shifted a little bit of focus in that we noticed that there's a lot of these frameworks that people have that need to be updated. So essentially, like uh, whenever I went from VisualWorks 2.5 to VisualWorks 3 to VisualWorks 5, at various points in time, various companies decided to stop upgrading. And so now, you know, 20 years later, there's probably still companies using VisualWorks 2.5 instead of VisualWorks 8.1 or whatever it is now. And essentially, you know, so we have all these different frameworks that are upgraded, but the software that uses those frameworks aren't upgraded. So that, that we, we saw as a new opportunity. Essentially, the idea is that with a, a framework update, you can release your new packages and or release your new rewrites or refactorings with that and automatically convert the people's code. So one, one example we did as a demo, probably this might even predate the refactoring browser stuff, was that I had worked on the a hot draw drawing editor um, a few years before refactoring, and so I updated it. And so I thought, what, what changes did I need to do to upgrade the exact code? So essentially what would happen was that um, I shipped the, the new version of the framework. I shipped some refactorings with that. I would file in uh, an example that used that. The old version of the framework, the refactorings would kick in and redo the code the way it needed to do for the new framework. And in this example, essentially, um, what would happen is those handles on like that circle there would need to be transformed. And if it could not transform it, it, it actually used the old existing version of handle, which the, and for this, we just had the old handle display itself in red, so you can immediately see which things aren't converted. And in this example, the handle in the middle of the circle hadn't been converted. But we weren't the only ones that actually thought about the layer replacement. Um, a company, um, Cargill, who deals with grains, so that's a picture for the grain bin, um, saw that they had a, a fairly large system. I think it was like 5,000 classes, um, 385 windows. Essentially, 2,000 of those classes dealt with the data layer. And I think... Their problem was that the data layer access was taking 40-some percent of the time of their overall execution time. And they wanted to eliminate a lot of that. And they knew the real problem was that the data layer was too generic. It was written, you know, a few years back when somebody thought, oh, let's make everything generic. And we, so we had to, they had a too generic data layer, and they wanted to replace it with a more specific one. And they estimated, I think, that it would take um, essentially about four and a half man years of development work to actually change these 2,000 classes that use the data layer. So what, what they decided to do was use the rewrite tool. And I know the one guy who did this, you know, and, and we met him at a few different conferences, so, he, he so he, he used the rewrite tool, and over a three-week uh, let's see now it's I think it was over a six-week uh, period. They came up with um, several rewrite rules to actually transform their code. So they did. Let's see, get this right. They made 17,200 changes to the code. Uh, 187 of them, which was manual, the rest of them were. Um, all rewrites. Now, over a three-week testing period, they did. They found 30, 30 bugs total, and which most of those bugs were in the manual changes. And so they 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 thought that essentially that um, 
it came out to be 34 times faster if they did it with the rewrite tools than, than they would have done manually. Of course, they weren't the only company that noticed this. Um, there was, um, at the time, I was also working for a company that did uh, small talk migrations, and they had several projects where we did migrations from Visual Smalltalk Enterprises to VA Smalltalk. I think they also did one to Dolphin, but you know they were essentially doing all kinds of Smalltalk migrations. And all those used the rewrite tool as well. Um, so basically, they, they, did, they had their own UIs. They didn't use their the rewrite tools to do the UIs, but all the code was done through the, the, the rewrite tool, the refactoring browser, essentially. Now, this led us to think, you know, if this is so nice to have for small talk, what about other languages? And initially, we thought we could build a refactoring environment for uh, Visual Basic, but we, so, so we thought, you know, the first thing you need is to, to make a, a parser and so we came up with Smack, which is the Smalltalk compiler compiler, kind of named after Yak, which is yet another compiler compiler. So what we wanted to do is make uh, parsers a little bit easier to generate than the standard at the time, as TGen was the only way to implement them. Of course, we did, we did uh, decide not to do Visual Basic at the end just because we, we wisened up. But, uh, so part of the smack stuff is that um, we wanted to make it so that we saw that the rewrites were really powerful in the refactoring browser. We wanted to bring that to other other um, areas too. And so part of that is to make a, a code generating framework so we can generate ASTs fairly easily and along with all the traversal algorithms. And we can generate the matching code to. And once, once all that's generated, all the, of the, the standard uh, transformation code is um, included per default as part of the standard SMAC code. So in standard SMAC, there's essentially, uh, once you have uh, the uh, ASTs generated, you have essentially two different types of transformations. One is you can do a, a standard pattern-based transformation similar to the refactory browser, which in this case the patterns are um, just the, the back quote, variable name, back quote. And so here, here we have a pattern that matches some Delphi code, which the N expression of Delphi, so if, what it's saying is A is in the range of B to C. And the replacement is also something that looks like a pattern. Although, unlike the refactory browser, it does not create a parse tree. It just does string-based replacement. So this, this whole pattern basically replaces the Delphi code of A in this range with the C-sharp equivalent of A is greater than or equal to B, you know, the bottom end of the range, and A is less than or equal to the top end of the range. So the other type of transformation is the um, basically an edit operation or code based. And what we found by doing several different migrations at, at various points in time, you need to have you know, something a little bit more powerful than just a rewrite expression. You just want to write code to do the, the transformation. So we, we try to make it where you can implement all that in Smack. And so essentially this one here, this expression, is matching a Delphi try catch expression. And all, all we're really doing is essentially the first self-continue means process further down the tree. Then we just replace the, the try part of the Delphi with a try parenthesis for C-sharp and a replace part with the ending parenthesis for C-sharp. Then afterwards, we make sure that all the semicolons are added after each expression because Delphi is a separator-based version and C-sharp is a terminator-based version. But 
by allowing code, we can do other things like load external files. We can, you know, do whatever we want. And so, essentially, we, we allow the programmer to control everything that they, they can possibly want in the, in the transformation itself. So, what, what happens is we, we came up with basically language migrations. And in language migrations, they're, they're, they're kind of like refactorings in that essentially the program that you had before, you want it to run the exact same way as it does you know, before as, and now. However, you want it to run on something totally different. And so, yeah, and... And for those who can't see some of the things here, but the, you can see on the, the left you have the, the, the washing machine and with the, the, where you can wash your malware, but on the right you have the German type sexual ha harassment as a dish. To eat. But, but essentially, um, the, you know, at one level it's a refactoring, at another level you might not consider it a refactoring. And at one level, it's, you know, little baby steps to write all these rules. At another level, you're writing everything so that you can run it at once. So the idea is that, you know, you take your SMAC. Um, for the Delphi, we, we took the SMAC. We, we generated a Delphi parser. After um, about a year and a half, we had um, a Delphi to C Sharp a migration tool that took a program that was a one and a half million lines of Delphi code and changed it into a, basically an equivalent one and a half million lines of C sharp code. Um, at some point, you know, a lot of people think that, oh, this is, you know, the migration is kind of automatic, but it, this allowed us to, you know, it's not all that automatic in which we had to write, I think, somewhere around 14,000 rules or whatever. Since, since then, we've also used this to, to migrate uh, Java to EGL, which EGL, um, probably not too many people are familiar with, but it's uh, IBM's, I think it's called Enterprise Generation Language. Um, essentially, the, the Java program was, uh, I think, around 3 million lines of Java that had been generated from Visual Age Generator for Java. Um, which is a template-based framework. Um, about one and a half million lines of that was, I think, just Java Beans code, which we just ignored. Um, so essentially, we were converting a million and a half lines of Java into EGL. Now, EGL, one of the things it does is it generates, uh, you can generate, have it generate a JavaScript front end, it can generate a Java middleware, and it can generate COBOL on the back end. So we took a, a Java program that basically is a Java front end talking to a COBOL back end. We made it a three-tier um, Java or JavaScript front end web browser talking to a Java like Tomcat server and then talking to the COBOL back end. And I think that took, took me about um, one and a half years for that too. So, the, what, what is the future of refactoring? Um, one of the things is that essentially after 20 years, programmers still aren't really using refactorings. I don't, you know, if I took a poll here, probably besides rename and maybe ex extract, I doubt that anybody's really used, you know, too many percentage of this audience has really used refactoring in the last in a month. And part of that is that essentially in 20 years we still have the same set of refactorings. And it's probably even longer than that. I think if I throw up that first slide with I had the refactoring tool, most of the, most of the refactorings in the refactoring browsers today are exactly that same set with the extension of um, extract method and inline method. I think the rest of them are probably from that set. Um, 
The other thing is, is that IDE developers don't really consider programmers. Um, there's too many tools, like I'll take Eclipse, for example, probably simply no Eclipse, but all they want to do is throw a refactoring under a refactoring submenu, and there you have it. Then they're not thinking about what the programmer is really thinking about when they select a piece of code. So um, I know that we never, in the refactory, the first version of refactory browsers, we never had a menu option called refactoring. We didn't want to think, the programmer to think of it as different oh, than any other program transformations. So we never had that. And for most people, they want to say it's a checklist. So I hope we got refactoring support, check. And so it's easier to do that checklist if you have one menu that has all the refactorings and you're, you're really not thinking of the, the users. Um, I think basically um, refactoring should be progressed along the lines of, okay, when a user selects some piece of text, what are they really wanting to do with that text? What are they really wanting to do with that selection? So if, if I select an assignment, what am I really, you know, what are my possible opportunities for changing that assignment? Do I want to inline that assignment or whatever? And I think most IDE developers do not think of the programmers in that way. They're just, oh, let's throw this somewhere on the menu and they'll find it. As far as on the transformation sides, is that most programmers, I don't believe, think in terms of transformations. They think in terms of low-level edit operations. Their, their transformations are essentially on the, um, if they can write a regular expression, that's, that's the kind of transformations they think of. They don't think in terms of um, tree-based transformations. Of course, part of that issue is that it is still difficult to write those transformations. And I think there we need to come up with a different way of writing them because obviously a lot of people do not understand the, the tree-based um, syntax that I have created. And I think part of that is to come up maybe with a different user interface or what, but um, I don't think any of the tree-based ones are going to get it for for several of the programmers. And, and finally, the, the basically the, the one of the things is that the framework developers seem to keep forgetting their users and that whenever they produce a new version of something, they're not actually producing the, the, the transformations or the code base to, to actually change that the previous version of the code into the new version of the code. And that's the reason why things like um, people still use VisualWorks 2.5 because oh, you know, at some point they said, nope, we're going to 5i. And several of the users said, that's just too much work for us. We'll stick with 2.5. And I, I, I think that is a, a big place for improvement in all the refactoring is that if we could get it to where whenever a new version of something is shipped, we could make it where the changes necessary to upgrade that version also are shipped. So with that, I'm pretty much complete. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Yes?
So I want, when I have a method and I want to put it in my super class, I don't care that after the move, that the code doesn't be exactly the same. I, as a developer, I know uh, how my application works, or at least I have a test to make sure that uh, things are working correctly. So if I want to move this method there, I don't want the refactoring tool to do a lot of things for me, I don't want the refactoring tool to move things around, I just want to move this method from this class to this class. And this is what I think uh, is missing in the tools that we have today. I would like, uh, instead of refactoring, I would like uh, small changes. Move this method from here to there, uh, yeah, and actually that is a point that I've <coughs> I've come around to, essentially. Um, you know, I think Kent Beck was the one that pr pr probably brought it home for me, and that one of the um, which one of the bugs he'd sent, or basically he knew it wasn't a bug, but he thought it should be changed was the extract method. So he, he went to extract method, extract, he wanted to extract it into this, you know, method called whatever. And the tool would not allow him to do that because the superclass implemented that. So it said, nope, that's not a refactoring. We won't allow you to do that. And which he pointed out that essentially the tool could still extract that. We could have warned him that saying, oh, you're overriding the method. Is that what you're wanting to do? But, you know, the way it is now, he tried to do it, it didn't work, so you're left doing it on your own. And I think from his example, that, that, that proved to me that you're, you're, you're exactly right in that some of these, these transformations are basically too, you know, too limiting because you really do want to do a little bit more in the refactoring itself. And so that, um, you know, if I was building a tool today, I would probably work more to that, that level. Of course, we didn't know that back 20 years ago when we started, but that I think you're exactly right in that some of these um, do need to be examined and seeing what, what, what the programmer is really wanting to do, not just, uh, oh, are we matching some refactoring and being behavior preserving. Yes? I'd like to know, what is your strategy based on your experience? So initially, the way we did that um, was to just change everything. <laughs> and if you didn't want, want something, you could always file out the parts that you wanted, you know, start a new image, file in that code that you changed, and that's the way you did it. Um, then later on, we decided, after having change objects, we decided, you know, we could just throw up the change objects to the developer. They could sort and choose which ones they wanted. And that's kind of how we've done it. Um, I think you could also do it by saying, um, you know, you have these five packages I'm working on, just refactor within those five sets of packages. And then, yeah. Yes? Have, have you thought about, uh, uh, for sure, uh, you know, adding some uh, help from the uh, type inference systems that we have right now uh, to the platform browser or not? It's Make so um, the, type, the problem with type inferencing is consider most of this work was done 20 years ago, and back then I think my machine probably had either 8 or 16 megabytes, and you know ran a thousand times slower than a machine today. So we that was just one of those points, you know, where I was on the good enough slide that it would have made things too slow to use, you know. Today's systems, it might be better. I don't know. You know, you might be able to figure out some of that. Um, I have a feeling after, at some stage, you know, the typing's just going to get to where it can't figure out stuff. And I don't, but I just don't know, know enough about that. I don't. I also wanted to mention that in Faro, there is an option where you select text and it suggests to the uh, factor that you could do that text and not, it doesn't show you all the factors. Yeah, because yeah, basically the original refactoring browser. I don't know, you know, 
Um, essentially, you'd select something, right-click, and it would just show you things you can do on that selection. Um, there was some things like we, we can probably redone how the selection was handled. Sometimes you had to be pr pretty precise on how you, how you selected a particular thing. And which, you know, now as I step back and think about it, you know, most users aren't going to be that precise to think about how they make their selections. They're just going to, you know, if they want to do something with an assignment statement, if they just put the cursor in, you know, between colon equal, you should be able to figure out that they're probably wanting to do something with an assignment statement. Yes? So you're, you're meaning as me as a de developer using these tools afterwards. So there's just so many things that you just don't do beforehand that you can do afterwards. Um, so like I was at a project one day, you know, working on for a company, and they had something like you know some one big configuration class, which had you know thousands and thousands of lines of code in which nobody would touch, right? You know, you just go in and make your one little change to get your configuration, you know, whatever you needed. So one morning, I just went in and used extract method. And within a couple hours, I had reduced, you know, the size of that class by, I think, over 4,000 lines, just solely by extract method. And, you know, that's something that would not be possible if you didn't have tools to, to support that. So, to me, then, 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 then there's things like inlining, which, you know, as I mentioned earlier, that inlining to me was not a, you know, summary factoring that I wanted to perform. However, after I got it, um, using inline with extract, you can move functional boundaries around. So if you put some code in the wrong, wrong functional boundary, you can move it around by just using refactoring. So, you know, after you have those, that capabilities, I think you start to see new ways you can use them like that. Yes? Yeah, I have two questions. <laughs> One of them is when, when you transform from Delphi to C Sharp, how do you solve the problems of using different libraries? Because it's not only, you know, syntax transformation, the, the things that you have to do. And the other one is more personal. How many refactories do you use? So the Delphi to C Sharp, um, that's, I'll, I will be talking probably more about it tomorrow, but essentially what you do is you kind of define mappings. You say, you know, oh, that library function over there, um, this one over here works pretty much the same. You might, you might have to do a little bit of massaging, or you can um, have extension layers. You know, if something doesn't match almost one-to-one, -one, you might have to put in an extension method or whatever. As far as me, personally, which refactoring is, um, so now I do a lot of my stuff in Smack, in which I, I haven't added refactoring support to it yet. <laughs> but if I'm doing small talk, um, extract, inline, I, I've, I've done in the past my analysis, because um, I don't know if the refactoring browser still has it, but there's, there used to be a refactory change manager class which would keep track of basically the, the names of all the refactorings you've done. So you could just at any point go and look at the names of the refactorings and you see, oh, and, and it was in a bag. So you can say, oh, extract method we've done, you know, 50 times since, you know, the image had been started. So I, whenever I did that, um, essentially extract, renaming instance variables, or temporary variables, renaming instance variables, a little bit lower down, and re probably probably in line, then renaming methods and whatnot. But that's probably how the ordering. But extract is always right up there at the top, along with renaming temporaries. Any other questions? Yes.
great when we have so many tools, so easy to write bombs to be code, but someone's going to have to read that, and someone's going to have to maintain that on that, or it's cool to be code. Because it would be great, but that would be easier. We don't know our favorite piece of code. So essentially now what I work on is um, I try to get paying jobs. <laughs> so I, um, I have worked on various various tools for various companies, you know, but they've all been specific to different companies' needs. Um, along with you know the migrations that I've done, I've done a few, you know, just uh, particular to that company. So you know, if somebody needs to delete or whatever, I, I do not have a tool that does that, but you know, it's obviously something that that could be written. Um, but but you are right that you know code needs to be thrown away at times, and I don't know why people like to keep stuff around, especially in today's world of version control systems where they can go back. You know, 15 years and pull up the code if they need to, but let's let's just keep it in this method for you know 30 years more. It just always seems to, to puzzle me why people do that. But are there any more questions? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm not sure about this. I'm not sure if I have to fix it.